We are not going back down the Centaur Man hole, and welcome back to Fair Game. This is episode 9 of our Mega Man Soccer playthrough, in which we will be taking on Anchor. When you first look at the characters in Mega Man Soccer, Anchor seems like the outlying character. He's not from any of the first four games, he's from Mega Man Dr. Wily's Revenge, the Game Boy game. He's the very first Mega Man killer robot, a robot designed to specifically counter Mega Man's abilities. Towards that end, he's specifically equipped with a unique weapon, the Mirror Buster. Now, unlike his original incarnation, Anchor Super Shot does not have the ability to repulse enemy attacks. It is, however, a very strong Super Shot that basically equates Mega Man's. The three bosses that are coming up, Anchor, Proto Man, and Dr. Wily, are all pretty much game breakers in their own right. Anchor has basically Mega Man stats, but with 44 speed. This makes him, by the time you run into him in the campaign, the single fastest thing you've ever seen. And unlike the other Robot Masters you've seen up until this point, who have around the same speed like Cutman, Fireman, and Electman, he doesn't have any downsides to back that up. He's more or less average in every other stat, so he's pretty much got no major downsides. What takes him from simply being good, however, to being absolutely phenomenal, is that he makes one of the best goalies in the game, not due to stats, but due to the fact that he can block, like, 60% of the super shots in the entire game. It's for that reason that he's considered to be on the same tier as Proto Man and Dr. Wily, despite the fact that he's statistically inferior to both. Anger is kind of an interesting character, though, as far as the Mega Man series is concerned, and it's very interesting that despite appearing in only one game, he's gone on to have so many appearances outside of that game. You would think that, as a character whose sole purpose is quite literally to destroy Mega Man, He'd fittingly have a very cold and gloomy personality, and he kind of does, but there's more to him than meets the eye, and he's a very Japanese-themed Robot Master, which is kind of interesting. Many components of his design were later used in the Robot Master Yamato Man. Unlike the slightly more social Yamato Man, however, Anchor is a touch xenophobic. He's not comfortable around those he's not familiar with. He also has a general distrust of foreign-made robots, including the Cossack numbers and the Light numbers. He is, however, incredibly loyal to those who earn his trust, especially his fellow Mega Man killer robots, Balad and Punk. Outside his initial appearance in the original Game Boy game, he also shows up in Mega Man 5, also the Game Boy version, as well as Mega Man 10, which surprised the hell out of me. You can actually fight him there and earn his Mirror Buster if you're playing as Mega Man. Doing so actually gives you a reason to use Mega Man over Base or Proto Man, since he can actually make use of those. Actually, that's a serious problem I have with Mega Man 9 and 10, is that they base the Mega Man in them off the least capable of all of the Mega Man, the one from Mega Man 2. The one that can't slide yet, the one that doesn't have the charge shot yet. There's not even a reason given for it, no explanation for why Mega Man now has this catastrophic ability loss. You're just told to accept it and go play Proto Man if you want an actual experience that involves the old-style Mega Man while taking double damage. At least by including the boss weapons from the Mega Man Killers, Mega Man 10 tries to fix that problem. Part of me feels like the only reason they handled stuff that way is because Proto Man was way easier to do if you just made him a Mega Man clone with the later abilities. Which every Yahoo who has played Mega Man 3 immediately scratches their head at because Mega Man could slide in that. That might seem like a really weird point of contention for me, because really, what does it matter? After all, you've played through Mega Man 1 through 3, Jameis, including the Game Boy games, and you didn't have the charge shot in any of those. If I have to explain it in more detail, I think it's because Mega Man, as a series, has always been an evolutionary process. Despite its sheer age, Mega Man 1 is competent. It's still well made, it still plays well, despite being so old and so broken around the edges. I mean, yeah, you have the Yellow Devil boss and the fact that the game can crash if you're touching the door when Dr. Wily dies, but from humble beginnings comes a really good idea. Every single Mega Man game after the first improved on this design and upgraded the mechanics. Two gave us the three items that you can use to increase your mobility. Three gave us Rush and the Slide. Four gave us the Charge Shot and Adapters. Five gave us the Super Arrow and some modifications to Rush. Mega Man 6 then gave us the Jet Adapter and Power Adapter, which gave us Power Mega Man and Jet Mega Man. And Mega Man 7 combined those two. And Mega Man 8 introduces a bunch of stuff like the Buster Upgrades, Mega Ball, new modifications to Rush, and more. 
Something you'll notice, however, is that, with the exception of the early games having some of their stuff supplanted by stuff in the later games, there's never anything taken away. You can certainly make the argument that Mega Man and Base kind of does, by virtue of not having access to any of Russia's old upgrades. But Mega Man's core mechanics are, for the most part, unchanged. You still have the charge shot, you still have the slide. Nine is the one that upends that. You suddenly don't have the charge shot or slide anymore, and there's no explanation for why. And the reasons I've heard given for why that was removed have ranged from logical, giving it an easy way to put in Proto Man, to semantic, we wanted to make it more like Mega Man 2, to ridiculous. Well, you didn't need the charge shot or slide in the first place. That's one of the reasons why, even though I really like the ideas behind Mega Man 9 and 10, both of them kind of rub me the wrong way just because of this. Actually, one of the reasons I like Mega Man 10 better than Mega Man 9, despite 9 being objectively the better game, is because Proto Man and Base are included by default and you can play as either one of them. In giving him access to the Mega Man killer weapons, at least Mega Man 10 gives Mega Man something that Base and Proto Man do not have. I openly acknowledge that this is kind of a weird thing to get hung up on, considering... Things like the Charge Shot and Slide are so ubiquitous that many Mega Man clone games use them. Rosen Crew Stilette uses both. Mega Mari doesn't, but the character models are smaller and you can still graze in it, since it's still sticking pretty strongly to its Toho heritage. Just an oddity, really. Anchor actually had an appearance in Mega Man 2.5, and is actually one of the hardest boss fights in the game. You actually have to fight him, then Punk, then Balad in a row. And all of them are full strength straight from the games. You can actually run into Anchor, and all of the Mega Man killer robots for that matter, in Mega Man 8-Bit Deathmatch. He's a hidden boss fight that will show up if you win enough matches in a row. You take him on in the Flashman arena, and you have to fight him on the spot. Unfortunately, his fight is a little bit buggy for a few reasons. I do not know if anyone else has had this problem, but in my game, he bugged out and immediately charged me the second the fight started, knocking me out of the arena, killing me instantly, and basically ending the fight. And you only get one shot with the guy. Thankfully, in a second playthrough, he did not bug out, and I managed to beat him anyway, but the fact is, his boss fight kind of sucks in Mega Man 8-Bit Deathmatch. Less because of the mechanics. The mechanics of the fight are solid, but because his arena is basically a square with a gigantic bottomless pit around it. Meaning, if he hits you once, and the entire outer edge is a Flashman stage, so it is ice, you will slide right off. Your reward for beating Anchor is actually being able to use the Mirror Buster for the rest of the chapter, which is a kind of cool little trick. Punk and Balad are the same way, giving you access to the Screw Crusher and Balad Cracker. But again, only for the rest of the chapter, so it's really not that big a deal either way. Of course, you can also play as them in Mega Man 8-Bit Deathmatch, which is kind of cool. Certain stages actually have their weapons with no need to ever fight their bosses, so... It's just an optional little boss fight you can play with, that's it. Actually, one of my favorite things in Mega Man 8-Bit Deathmatch is any stage that gives you access to the Eddie Call. Basically, Eddie will show up and randomly drop off a random weapon that is not currently on the stage you're currently playing on. So if you happen to be on a stage with, say, nothing but Mega Man 2 weapons, don't be surprised when this thing shows up and drops off the Napalm Bomb, Flame Blast, or hell, even the Black Hole Bomb. It's a great way to inject a little bit of chaos into a match since it can also drop off something that is absolutely useless to you, like the Gravity Hole on an entirely horizontal map. I actually think Anchor may be one of my favorite characters in Mega Man Soccer. Less for his raw stats, or cheese ability in this case, and more for the fact that he's really got a cool design and, frankly, a fantastic color scheme. I also find it interesting that he has his own stage. It's actually a really cool one, too. It's a modification of the Mega Man stage, albeit with a little bit of quirks all its own. I mean, yeah, you can boil it down to, oh, hey, it's another palette swap stage, but hey, at least it looks cool. And the music's decent, too, so there's that. You know, I went over some stuff recently with Zell, and as it turns out, Mega Man Soccer's music is actually probably its single most polarizing element. Like, most Mega Man games have at least a fistful of awesome music tracks, and even the ones that are mostly loaded with some crap ones have a few really, really good ones. Mega Man Soccer's tend to pinball between average, decent, and awful. You have some really bad ones, like Fireman's stage, and then you have some good ones, like Anchor's stage, and then you have some really, really good ones, like Proto Man and Dr. Wily stages. It's mostly just more to suggest just how ball-shatteringly fast the development cycle in Mega Man Soccer was. Almost no game goes from core concept to full production in three months. This one did. 
the fact that it didn't just cause any Super Famicom it was plugged into to freaking explode is probably testament to how good Capcom's development teams are. Actually, there's a really compelling argument to be made that that particular element of Capcom is actually why Mighty No. 9 turned out the way it did. Don't worry, I'm not about to start beating a dead horse here. My friend Neil, however, who both kickstarted Mighty No. 9 and actually enjoyed it quite a bit, gave me a bit of insight on what exactly he feels went wrong on it. He pointed out three areas where Mighty No. 9 has fundamental problems. Level design, implementation of game mechanics, and game balance. It is absolutely worth noting that these are areas where other Mega Man games have had those exact same failings. Specifically, Mega Man and Base, and most of the later Mega Man X games. In all of those games, however, the problems came from the same source. Either the game was rushed, or they just didn't have enough budget to do proper QA testing. Knowing what I do about Mighty No. 9, I don't think it's a case of malice or incompetence. KJ Inafune is a decent developer, and he does have a history of putting out some fantastic stuff with Integrates. However, like a phenomenally skilled writer or director or actor, he's only as good as the weakest link in the chain. You can be the best writer on the planet, but if your director is freaking incompetent and has no idea what they're doing, or is constantly getting undercut by the producer, your show is going to suck. You can be the best actor in the history of the universe, and if your writing team is a bunch of morons, you're not going to be able to show it. So, what am I getting at with all this? A lot of Comcept staff are people who, prior to working on Mighty No. 9, have not worked on anything else. When Inufune was working with Capcom, he had Capcom staff to fall back on for all of his ideas. And these were industry veterans. They knew their stuff. Even the most half-baked idea that Inafune had could have been salvaged just because of how good Capcom's team is, considering many of them have decades of experience. Comcept staff, meanwhile, is much smaller and much less experienced. Many of them have never worked on anything else before. Indeed, a lot of them, self-admittedly, don't have a huge amount of experience with the Mega Man series. Mighty No. 9 is a legitimately tragic case. And I genuinely don't think that Neil is wrong when he says that under the game's problems, there is a good game desperately trying to happen here. Almost all of Mighty No. 9's problems, in fact, can be traced to one single origin point. And that point is Comcept itself. And ironically, I don't really think it's all Comcept's fault either. Think back to some of the biggest problems that Mighty No. 9 has had development-wise and community-wise. You can look at Mighty No. 9's infamous community management scandal and gather a lot from the company as a whole. For the uninitiated, Mighty No. 9's community manager was a woman named Dinah about Karam. Karam had no experience with community management, with Mega Man, or really much of anything. She was appointed to the job by her own admission because her boyfriend was one of Mighty No. 9's developers. The Mighty No. 9 community started to have problems with Karam almost immediately after she was appointed. She was extremely hostile towards the community in general and had a rather notorious tendency to run the forums as her own personal little fiefdom. I am neither joking nor exaggerating about that. She had a notorious tendency for banning people for simply disagreeing with her or telling her she was wrong about something. The problem is, the Mighty No. 9 official forums are ones that you could only access if you donated to a specific tier of the Kickstarter. Meaning, the people she's banning are the financiers of this game. She'd then proceed to go on social media and insult and make fun of the people who she banned. That's even stupider than attacking your own customers. That's attacking the people who are paying for you right now. By the time she was finally fired from her position, her sheer mismanagement had led Mighty No. 9 to suffer a massive chargeback campaign. And while the actual numerical financial damages may never be fully known, there were a number of super backers who were part of this chargeback campaign, meaning the financial damage was at least tens of thousands of dollars. She then proceeded to openly insult her former employer on social media for several days. Now I'm going to play devil's advocate here. I don't think anyone at Comcept had any idea that she was going to be this bad when she was originally appointed to the position. There is a fundamental lack of understanding about community and community management that threads through that entire scandal. No one thought, hey, maybe we should do something about this long before the problem hit critical mass. And honestly, a lot of that seems to be just because of how psyched they were to work on the game, and I can't really blame them for that. 
everything suggests that they were handed an opportunity that none of them ever expected to have, and they wanted to make the most of it, but their lack of experience kept getting in the way. This is probably why comms have kept doing stuff that was so openly tone-deaf and so short-sighted. From them trying to kickstart Red Ash during it at the same time because they were riding high on the success of the first Kickstarter, to the laughably bad trailers that spawned instant memes, and no, I'm not going to be mocking one right now because you already did them all and I'm not here to live up to your expectations, Mom! What I'm getting at is, I think their inexperience is what ultimately cut them off at the knees. And while it is a shame that the game failed the way it did, at least it wasn't a complete failure. The thing's at least playable. I have played way worse. And if a lesson can be learned from it, then I think that's for the best. I actually really do hope to see Unifune again sometime. I don't think he's ever going to get away with crowdfunding anything again. But allowing him to work with other teams who may actually have more experience is certainly not out of the question. I remember almost 15 years ago playing Mega Man Extreme 2 and talking with Neil at the time. And in Front Loading Zero the way I had, I made it basically impossible to get the true ending of the game. And Neil said, sometimes you gotta fail in order to learn how to not fail next time. And if there's anything that we can learn from the Mighty Number no. 9 fiasco, it's that. There's an argument to be made that one of the most important things that we learn as people is perseverance through despair. Failures and losses happen, but as long as we learn from them, and as long as we put them to good use, it's not a problem. Anyway, we've won and successfully gotten an anchor for our team, so stay tuned for next time when we make Dr. Wiley cry like a violet. I'm not doing this joke. Screw 